Hi, my name is Sean Shaler, and this is my friend Chris Ford, a.k.a. The Objective Geek. Why don't you just laugh at your own name? You really are my friend Chris Ford, The Objective Geek. And we have something special for you today. It is the Season 1 finale of Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, that is, I keep saying season. It's really Book 1 water, as real fans would yep. refer to it. And it's the finale. It's called Siege of the North. It's a two-part episode. And it, spoiler alert, is an excellent episode. So I'm pretty jacked up to talk about it. But first, Chris, how are you? I'm doing good. We're recording this on Valentine's Day, so um, whatever. That, that's exactly my feelings. A happy, uh, happy Thursday, really, is all it amounts to. And, but you know what? If you do celebrate Valentine's Day, happy Valentine's Day, I suppose. But only in the same sense that you can have a happy day any day that you want. And so in, in some news... <laughs> Some, it's not big news, but I consider it big in the sense that, Chris, you have put out several videos, um, a couple of really fun ones, in my opinion, since the last time we talked. Yeah, it's hard to really... I've been working too hard on something that pays me nothing, uh, <laughs> but it's just fun to do. Uh, yeah, so my, my latest video is fan casting for the upcoming Batman movie directed by Matt Reeves. Ben Affleck is out of the role now, which I like Ben Affleck in the role, but I'm very excited for um, for a newcomer in there to be the actor. And then I fan casted pretty much everyone who would probably could be in the movie, ranging from Rose Gallery to supporting characters like all the Robins and Batgirl and Batwoman. So I have that video out there. And then I have a video that I worked really hard on, The Untold Life of Uncle Iroh, or just The Untold Life of Iroh. Um, the subtitle is Finding Meaning in Tragedy, and that video really covers my covers some theory, uh, some of my theory, and covers some you know facts about Iroh and what his journey went through from his son's death to his journey through the spirit world, um, and also use a lot of you know real world applications to his life, and also use a lot of uh, creator from. Brian Knitsko and Michael DiMartino's uh, commentary on Iroh. And I think that that and I have video... a couple other. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, then I have a couple other you know, reviews and stuff out there like Glass. And I think you liked Glass a little more than most people. Not not that people really didn't like it, but I think you liked it a little more than most people. Is that fair? Yeah. I love that's fair. I loved Glass. Excellent. Well, I'm glad you liked it. I I will probably see it, but I didn't even see Split yet. So. <laughs> And then I know I'm yeah. in the minority, but or no, I'm not. I'm not. What was I going to say? I'm cliche, the exact opposite of in the minority. I don't think I'll miss Ben Affleck as Batman very much. It's not. There was nothing to not like there. He just didn't stand out to me at all as Batman, so I probably won't miss him. And then, uh, Fair enough. right, I don't want to bash him. It was fine, I guess. <laughs> and then as to your video, the Iro video, and. Also, that one in the Zhao Moon Spirit video, I think we're going to find tie in very nicely to some powerful themes mm. today. So it, uh, it absolutely does. What a what a great segue! But I'm going to interrupt the segue by telling you some other things first. I mean, instead of a good segue, what if I talk about this stuff that's not related? Uh, first thing, I'm I'm going to start a retro gaming group in Olathe because this sounds kind of childish, but I've had a hard time not making friends, but making retro gaming friends because there's no local mm. good game store here or anything like that. So I'm going to start a new gaming group at the library and it's going to be uh, very free and very relaxed. And mostly, even if nobody shows up, it's going to be my excuse to sit around and play video games for about three hours once a month. Very excited about that. And then also, I've got some news, Chris. Our podcast dream of being on iTunes is almost dead, very close to dead, or it would have been dead, but I have seen the light, and it's called Podient? Po 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 Podient? I don't know how to say it. Long Probably story. guessing Podient because of podcast. Podcast, yeah. Podient? <laughs> uh, like Defiant? I don't know. Long story Ooh. short, so we do this okay. for YouTube. And if we're being really honest with ourselves, it's just kind of to beef up your YouTube channel and because we enjoy it. I would say those are the two biggest reasons. But it would be fun just to be on iTunes and be on Google Play. Uh, but the only place the audio is stored is Mixcloud. Long story short, for legal music reasons, Mixcloud doesn't allow you to uh, be on iTunes or Google Play. But this thing that I found, I can move all of our podcasts there if I'm ever actually motivated enough, and we'll be able to put our podcasts on iTunes and Google Play, which 
Again, may not help a thing in terms of viewership or anything, but it'll feel cool. Something to like slap on the resume, I guess. So, uh, Podian. You can say that, hey, I'm on iTunes. So. And uh, I guess what's important here, there's lots of places that do that. I should have clarified, this is the only one that's free. And it has some other hindrances and things. Uh, but in terms of storage and upload, it's free. And that's what we need. I don't think we're looking to invest money in our bi-weekly podcast about Avatar. No offense to anybody. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. uh yeah, that's pretty exciting. But now, back to the good part of the segue. I knew I should have ended with yours instead of mine. Chris, any cleanup? It's been a while since we've done a video, but any cleanup from last video? I have no idea. I listened to it. I know that. I listened to it like the day after I post it, and it's been four weeks since then because I went on vacation. So All I remember is I do like both of the episodes that we reviewed fairly well, and I believe that both of them take place in... No, one of them was in the in the air temple, and then North they go. The air temple. Yeah, they go to this, and, and they, they meet the uh, the fake flying people, not the real airbenders, because they don't have spirit. And I really do like that episode, as we discussed. And then they go to the Northern Water Tribe, and are introduced to Iwe and the Northern Water Tribe in an episode that you really liked. Good episodes. I think it was a good show. I don't really remember. All I remember yeah. is that you liked one episode, and I liked the other. And so, well, that kind of is a synopsis. They've already been in the Northern Water Tribe for one episode, and basically it amounts to, in that episode, uh, Sokka meets Iwe and kind of falls in love, but finds out she's engaged in a, a, I can't think of the word, an arranged marriage. And uh, Katara gets really... uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say her name is Iwe. Iwe, yes. I I had to look up how to spell it because I was like... I don't I even think know what it's Y U E. It is, yes. That is what I found. Mm-hmm. At least according to Wikipedia, which is always right. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is Y U E. So yeah. U A. Mm-hmm. And yes. Katara gets really mad because the waterbending master, who mm-hmm. Aang needs to teach him waterbending, he's basically like the only waterbending master that we really know of at this point. They don't really say that. Uh, but like, where else are you going to go find a waterbending master? And he needs to teach Aang. Katara wants him to teach her as well. But it's still a very uh, very sexist kind of culture up there, very old-fashioned, and he's not interested. And then there's a killer fight at the end. So yes. that's really that episode, which does lead directly into this episode, where at the beginning, which I love at the beginning, Katara is fighting all of his other pupils, <laughs> like sparring with them, essentially. And they don't really go anywhere with this mm. other than to show, like, such a quick growth in relationship yep. and Katara's skills is they don't really do anything else with it. Uh, but Katara's just whooping up on all these other dudes and that's the start of the episode. And it's just a happy, uh, a happy throwback to the previous episode that I really like. But long story short, we are on siege of the North part one. Yeah. So we start off with that, uh, which I think that was needed because like you said, show her growth. And also, I mean, she's going to be in some big fights coming up. So you can't just go from, oh, I just started learning from a master to straight to, oh, I can challenge this person who's been like our main antagonist the whole time. Uh, so that was very necessary. And then uh, you get to see Sokka and Princess Yue spend some time together. And when I was first watching this today, I was like, man, this is this is really like slow. There's not that much story here. Like, why is it even necessary? But then after watching the whole part, all part one and part two, which I can get to it, I think it was really necessary to show this relationship between Sokka and Yue, um, you know, start to nurture and really grow and really see how much Sokka cares for her and how much she cares for Sokka. And, and just also the fact that they can't be together, like there's this forbidden love. And because she, she might not love that person, but she loves her country and what she's willing to do for them. And that is just such a great character trait for her. I think was done really well to start off these episodes. I think you can't, I don't know if they aired on the same day, but I do know that at least in the other two part episodes, I believe they did air on the same day, which if I hope so in this case too, because you really can't take the first episode of this without the second episode. Like they, I mean, they're, it's a two part episode. Sometimes you might turn those into cliffhangers and show in this week and another one next week. Like, you can't judge this episode alone, as you mentioned with Sokka and Yue. It just 
it would be very awkward and slow, I think. Yeah. Uh, so then when they're there, um, Sokka notices that pretty much the Fire Nation is attacking, and they pretty much go back, and then the battle, I think, starts from there, and Aang kind of goes out and, and tries to fight them. And I didn't really care for Aang fighting the airships. Like, it's it's really weird, because I was kind of half paying attention to this part and, and, and watching the show, because I was watching my son. And so I was really listening a lot, um, you know, just for, like, little things that trigger, like, oh, I need to watch this scene. And, and like, this fight scene goes a pretty long time without really anyone saying anything, because it's just Aang fighting dispensable henchman number one <laughs> through <laughs> through ten. <laughs> you sound like Nigel Powers. Yeah, it's it's it seems a little bit like filler, like all right, we have this many minutes, take up yeah, how many yeah, how many I fire felt... ships can we have Aang uh, ruin in that span of yeah. time. Not that it's bad, it just I mean, it feels a little fillery. Yeah. And the, I mean and the point of it is to show that like alright Aang is out of his element here, like he's not going to be able to <clears throat> To take on all these people by himself, he needs to get help, but that could have just been easily done just by seeing these massive ships, like, oh crap, I can't take out all these ships by myself, I'm just one person, I need some help from maybe the spirits or something. They do tie um, that part but together him... nicely, I think, like, I think they do a nice job, of it. it's later on in the episode, but part of what you're getting at here is showing him, mm-hmm. not not beaten down, but exhausted at the end, and then, like you said, yeah. making that build up towards, where am I going to find help? Uh, so then Sokka has to, is this the episode where Sokka gets in a fight? He finds out who, who, uh, UA is marrying. Right? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, it's kind of oh, yeah. sprinkled throughout. Like they, it, it happens early yes. on shortly after the start of the fire nations attack. Uh, the, I believe it's the water mending master. Can you help me think of his name? Pot, uh, Pot, uh, master Paku. Paku. Thank you. And he essentially says we have a top secret mission and then he finds recruits uh, no, for this the... mission. And then that's the chief. The chief. Oh, that's you're right. Dad. It's not Paku. Yeah. And then I don't. I don't know his name. I don't but... remember either. But yeah. uh, they they recruit for a top secret mission, uh, which Sokka volunteers mm-hmm. for right away. And then it does. It goes away for most of the episode and comes back farther, closer towards the end. Uh, but yes, it does cause a fight between him and uh, UA's betrothed, who is kind yes. of a jerk. Maybe, yeah. maybe oh, there's too a couple things I love about that one scene. <laughs> yeah, well, they had to clearly show that he is not the right person. Yeah, for they, they had like um, two minutes to where... show that we have to not like this guy. <laughs> yeah. A scene where he's like, we need people for a top secret mission. And Sokka is kind of like, he takes on the mission in a way. And his reasoning is, it's kind of like, it's not to... It's not to ignore Princess UA, but he feels like, all right, well, if I'm not good enough for you, then I will prove myself, essentially. Um, and then when she, like, in th- this mission is a dangerous mission. And her expression when she, when he volunteers, she turns and she cries, and it's just one, you know, teardrop. That is just eloquently done. And that moment would not mean anything if we didn't have all this buildup of them two over the past, you know, 15 minutes or 10 minutes of this episode and the last episode. It would have been really awkward, if anything, yeah. Uh, sorry if you hear my dog in the background. He's very upset at something. Maybe he doesn't like this episode. I don't know. Charlie doesn't. Yeah. Why not this uh, episode, buddy? And then, and then I love the interaction between Sokka and, and the, I can't, I can't the, think of his name the water tribe people, the, the chief, guy. and also the, and the fiancé. And they're like... Here's the Fire Nation uniform, and Sokka lives. He's like, "That's not how the uniform is." <laughs> and then, and he's like, "No, nah, that's not how they are." And then he's like, "All right, our first mission is to find out their leader." And he's like, "His name is Admiral Zhao. He's angry all the time, has sideburns." <laughs> 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 and, I mean, I love that for a couple of reasons. That it shows that Sokka has been on a journey this whole time, and you know that fiance been belitt- belittling him. But Sokka has a lot of worth to him. They, I think they take the fiance a little over the top. Like we've been around Sokka enough that we all like Sokka. Like we don't need this yeah. much of a a disparity to be like, oh, you know what? Maybe Sokka would be better for it. Like it wouldn't take that much. But it is, it is a an infusion of some comedy where there's not much else in these episodes where 
the fiance keeps forgetting how to pronounce Xiao's name, <laughs> and uh, the uniforms like totally yeah. down. Oh, he, he also mispronounced. He also mispronounced Sokka's name. He calls him Soka. Soka, which, yeah, and Joe. Which this, yeah, which the movie does that too. So, the movie but, calls Sokka Soka. But the movie is like, not doing it for comedy. <laughs> the movie is no, doing not. it because it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible, but and, yeah. And and I will make you watch it, and we will review it. And then we will make a shot for shot remake of the office space <laughs> scene, and it's going to be fantastic. Um, yeah, okay, so on the flip side, <laughs> oh, yeah, so a good, yeah, good parallel happening on the other side here as well. Uh, you know, Zuko's alive and well. I don't know about well, he's kind of has Chilly. scars and more scars than the other yeah. scar. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got some like gross oh, looking open wounds and stuff. It's kind of nasty. Um, and then you know, him and Iroh had this very, very great moment before Zuko goes off on the secret mission to capture the avatar before Zhao does. Um, you know, I was being very fatherly to him, telling him like, you know, you need to be careful. Remember your breath of fire. And then Wear Zuko's like, coat, no, I'm fine. <laughs> exactly. Put up your hood. Like, this is literally what he says. And then he he's very serious with him. He says, you know, ever since my son died, I thought of you. And then Zuko knows what he feels. Like Zuko's like, you don't have to say it. Like, you know that. That moment says so much. One thing we didn't know before that Iroh had a son and he died. So that little bit of information just completely kind of changed the character of Iroh for us. We do in this episode. So I'm a little harder on, like, you're a big fan of Zuko's story arc, as am I. But up to this point, I'm a little harder on him. But I think this is the first time where I can remember uh, this episode and the next episode. Uh, just some of the things he goes through when he's infiltrating the the Northern Water Tribe's fortress or castle or whatever you want to call it, and the relationship with I, uh, Iroh. This is the first time where I actually sort of respect and appreciate him. Like, I see the character right before, and he does some interesting and cool things. But in terms of me starting to hope maybe we could flip him uh, between this and some of the things that Iroh does in the next episode, uh, in the second part mm-hmm. of this episode... It's probably the first time I really like have a glimmer of hope. Like, hey, maybe Suko's gonna gonna turn a corner and be a really cool character at some point. At least upon originally watching. Obviously, having spoilers now, it doesn't no, hit I, me quite the same way. No, I think that's really accurate. Especially when we get to the next episode, that these two episodes change because they introduce some new characters that we it had no idea. The paradigm. <laughs> I think you're dead on with Iroh. Like it totally. Uh, 180s with the sun and then with a couple other things that happen in the second half of this episode uh, literally 180 on mm-hmm. character arc for Iroh like you always get a sense that he's a good guy uh, like like Zangief in uh, or uh, Wreck-It Ralph but he I don't know totally totally turns the corner there yeah uh, alright so then Aang has to go find spirits or go to the spirit world and Prince Yue takes him to the spirit oasis which is like just the most spiritual place in the Northern Water Tribe. And he pretty much goes into the spirit world. He sits in front of these two koi fish. And yeah, he goes in the spirit world. Um, and while he's there, he can't, of course, move his body. And Zuko shows up, and him and Katara have a really great fight. After swimming through like rivers of ice, and I know it's a, I know it's a cartoon, like I'm not impressed, so to speak, but. Uh, they're going to talk about sort of an important part of his character development to show how tough he is. So you've got a human that literally thrives on his ability to create fire, and he's swimming through ice with fatty seal things, <laughs> seal turtles and things like that just to infiltrate this lair and kill the Avatar. So it's, I don't know if there's any more dedicated moment uh, in the Zuko arc up to this point. I certainly don't think so. And then at the end of the tunnel, yeah. he has to fight the maybe the most powerful waterbender he's ever fought. Yeah, not that's out there now, but definitely. Yeah. At, at least at her peak, and you mentioned that build up of her earlier is very important. Like we can't just have her turn a corner and then she dispatches him somewhat easily right at first. It's a good fight, but uh Yeah, like and she does some great moves. She like freaking does a water wave up at him and then freezes him in place. She does and then she the straight up comes. Avatar freezes him, like <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. 
But then he's in there, he's talking, the... like he's in there moving his mouth. I'm like, hold up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that bugs me a little bit. <laughs> Details. And then he knows like you and he says, You little peasant, you found a you found a master. Yeah. And that's such an arrogant thing to say. I know, what a jerk here when I was just in, but no, I was very impressed with like <laughs> I said he he goes through all it uh, goes through hell to get there and then at the end he still has to put up a good fight against a great water right. bender and but then she gets too cocky like she does yeah zuko comes back and like he you know just the sun comes up which is a great visual sun comes up he just instinctively melts the ice around him and then he you know blasts her with the fire and then she just kind of like nonchalantly is like i'm going to block this and like nope <laughs> She was like, very cool you, you about it in a place where you can't around. be that cool about it. <laughs> Do yeah. you, uh, you know, I'll ask this after we're done here. Cause I think there's one more piece we need to talk about in this episode. And then I'll ask my question. And I guess the last piece would that be that we do, we do in this episode, get introduced to Zhao's plan. Kind of, he essentially mm, yeah. says, I've got a solution for this moon problem. Uh, because this is the first time I think, correct me if I'm wrong. This is the first time I think, that we truly understand that uh, the waterbender's power is so strongly mm-hmm. associated from the moon. They might allude to it previously, but here they're making a very strong point to no. There's a direct connection between how strong they are and and the moon being full and rising. Um, just as on the flip side, firebenders get their power from the sun, which is also noticed. So that's important. Is that Zhao yeah. mentions here that he's got a plan. And you kind of see the gears turn and you start to get worried. And that all happens in this episode here. Yeah, because Iroh tells him, he's like, you know, he's advising him or fake advising him. Like, listen, you're going to have to make sure that you fight them during the day because the full moon is going to be up and waterbenders can, you know, be powerful during the moon. And he's just like, yeah, I got a solution for the moon. Don't worry. He and does then, He does take the advice. Yeah. And then... um. I don't know if it's this episode. He says, I'm permanently removing the moon. That's the next spirit. one. That's the next one. Yep. And then, oh, okay. All right. I'll stop there. Um, but <laughs> what I do love. Spoiler alert. <laughs> God. Yeah. Just kidding. What I do Spoilers love about real. their exchange is that, is that uh, Admiral Zhao says to Iroh, like, this will not be like your failure at Ba Sing Se. Like, all right, this is the second time we've heard about Ba Sing Se. Because um, we've heard about it before. And Iroh says, you know, he says in a very sad manner, which, which we don't exactly know why that's so sad. Um, he says, you know, for your, for your, um, for your sake, for you your sake, hope I hope not, it's not. I hope no, for like, your sake, I hope that not. Is, and he sounds very genuine. Like he sounds like he means it, even though Zhao is a, a yeah. deserving monster. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so uh, I, that does bring me to the maybe uh, maybe the one thing that I dislike a little bit about both of these episodes is that uh, so the siege portion of this episode is very short. You get to see a little of Aang taken on the ships, uh, but not too much else. And also, not to jump too far ahead, but in the next episode, it takes even more of a backseat. It's like the episode's called Siege in the North, but there's so many other story things going on in in front of that in front of the actual siege taking place, uh, you almost forget that it's happening other than just, you know, Zhao bringing an army to uh, to break into the Northern Water Tribe, I guess. But I, I guess all I'm saying is it, it feels like a part of the background more than actual story. Hmm. It's very short. That's a, that's a very interesting... Yeah, that's a very um, interesting point because I listened to the commentary on this. And when they talked about, like, the actual firebenders invading the the northern water tribe they're like yeah and this didn't come out as like grand cinematic as we wanted it to yeah it's as grand as we wanted it to like we really wanted to show like this is a huge battle and just because of like time constraints and, and stuff we didn't really get to do all that yeah uh i didn't watch the commentary but i did note that on these episodes it's it's prompted that you can't like the other episodes I, it's not. It doesn't show up unless I go find it, or I haven't even looked. I don't know. But in these episodes, it's forefront. Yeah. Like, hey, do you want to watch these with commentary? And I almost <laughs> did, and then I looked at the clock and realized it was already like eight o'clock. I was like, yeah, probably better not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, I'm. It's cool that you brought that up. It makes me feel validated because it feels a little weak. But <laughs> it, it it turns out to be such a minor 
detail. Like, it's a vehicle, literally, for this episode. The siege is. It's just a vehicle. And that's fine. Yes. Uh, any other notes on this particular episode? No. It was, it was a very good uh, episode. And it just ends with um, Zuko and carrying Aang through the storm of really, like, what the heck is your plan? With all these nasty sores on his face and stuff, and he just looks beaten to a pulp. But, uh, yeah, he just, I was like, where are you going with Aang? How are you going to get out of here? But whatever, he'll figure it out later, maybe. I don't know. Find out next episode. Yeah. Um, I grabbed this picture because I was like, they're going straight for, like, Sub-Zero. Look here. <laughs> How can we make him look like Sub-Zero? I've got an idea. Uh, I do really like that look, like, when he's the blue spirit, and here, when he's doing stealthy things, I think that's Zuko at my favorite. I don't really know why. I just like mm. that part. No, I know. So that brings us to Siege of the North, part two, where we start off, like, very... Uh, it starts off very heavy hitting right away. Like, we're starting off with Aang in the spirit world, doing some crazy things. Yeah, he uh, meets up with Avatar Roku, and uh, Roku pretty much tells him, like... The only uh, Twan Lee, maybe he doesn't say Twan Lee. No, he doesn't say Twan Lee. He just says the Ocean Moon Spirit went to the physical. Does he know where they at? I don't uh, know. He, anyway, no, he, he says, says he, see... he does not know where they went. He says uh, you got to find uh, Twan Lee. Twan Lee. Twan. Lee? I don't remember. It's Twan Lee. Twan Lee. And you need to go see the Face Stealer because only he knows where they're at, or he's old enough. Yeah, because he's where been. A... At. Yeah, he's been. A... He's old enough. So, yeah, so this is a freaking great, <laughs> creepy, one of the top creepiest moments in, in Avatar. Horrifying. Yeah, Roku, Roku warns him that you cannot have any type of expression at all on your face when you are when you meet with him because he will steal your face. So Aang goes and meets with Ko, the face stealer, and just the voice acting with Ko and the way he moves and tries to trigger a response from Aang is just so interesting like when he first comes up to him he's like oh hello my friend the avatar it's been quite a time since i've seen you like you know some like your last you know about 800 years ago you tried to murder me <laughs> because i took someone you loved and he shows like a vision of his wife of uh avatar korok's wife that jerk <laughs> <laughs> watch the avatar rankings video <laughs> Um, but then, like, just the way he turns it, and, and Angus asking, like, I need to protect the spirits, or I need to find the spirits so they can help me out. And then he's like, No, you have it wrong. Like, the spirits, you don't need the spirits, so the spirits need your help because someone's going to murder them. <laughs> it doesn't help the creepy. First of all, you're dead on, and he's absolutely creepy, and the voice acting, the way he moves, the face shifting and stuff is kind of awkward yeah. and creepy. And then you're hearing this deep, scary voice come out of these normal human faces. Like it, it's it, uh, it sets the tone. Uh, a couple and other also things. some animal faces too. Some animal faces as well. And it sets the tone. And also there is a monkey right outside that yes. has no face that like alerts essentially Aang to like, hey, I'm in the right place because that monkey doesn't yeah. have face. Also, monkeys in the spirit world apparently kind of a big thing because there was a monkey right when Aang showed up. That I don't know if he has a purpose, but later uh, comedy happens to him, and that's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, also face there's a monkey, creepy. there's a monkey lemurish type of person who uh, befriends Avatar Wan in Legend yeah. of Korra. So uh, monkeys are huge in the spirit world for some reason, not literally huge, huge uh, figuratively, but yeah, face stealer essentially clues him in to that you already have met these spirits. And then gives him a little more hint and prods him along. And then Aang's like, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. He gets a little excited. And that's exactly when Code Face Stealer runs to him just to catch his emotion. Mm -hmm. And Aang just says, I have to be going now. <laughs> that probably helps the creepy is Aang's deadpan expression the whole time, too. Like, that probably aids to the whole environment. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it all happens right here. Uh, but just for the sake of wrapping this portion up. Then to get out of the spirit world, he finds Hebai, which is the panda spirit. The mm -hmm. uh, Was that an earth world spirit or a spirit from somewhere in the earth kingdom that protected the little village? Yes. 
and or did it protect yep. the forest? I think it was this like a spirit of the forest, and that spirit yeah. he evolves into like the demonic form and torches the monkey that antagonized Aang when Aang first came in, and that really made me happy. So, but long story short, he does ride Heibai back to the physical world, and his body's not where he left it because Zuko had stolen it, and so then he kind of just has to his spirit just sort of flies really rapidly through through the air to find his body. And that becomes important later because it leads Sokka and Katara to him. Yeah. And before Aang wakes up, um, Zuko is talking a lot to himself. To like, Aang, to himself. Like you talk to a person yeah. in a coma and you don't think they're listening. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's funny because the creators was like, yeah, Zuko usually doesn't talk this long. Probably because nobody wants to listen to him. So this is his opportunity to, <laughs> to talk. It also it's uh, such that's a why I love stressful. Listening to the commentary because they honestly, they, I feel like they watch it as fans of the show. Um, They've got a good grip but, uh, on reality when but they the, watch he, it. He does, yeah, he does mention something key. Is like he's like, you know, I don't, I don't need help. I don't need luck. Mm. Oh, okay. First he says, um, gosh, you know, he's talking to Aang. You were he's born like, lucky. You're, you're so talented. Yeah, you're like my sister. My father said I was. she was born lucky, and I was lucky to be born. But that's okay. I don't need luck. I never needed it. I can do it on my own. Like, that's a great freaking character line that embodies Zuko a lot. Like, he just has to work hard, harder than anyone needs to work. Like, nothing comes easy for him. It helps that he looks like he's, uh, you know, he's a bloody, beaten up pulp hiding in a frozen ice cave with a person in a coma. Like he's, which I, okay. I think contributes to him talking to. Like I said, it's such a stressful situation, and they're literally waiting out a blizzard. Like, hey, maybe this is a good time to talk out some of my feelings to myself. Yeah, yeah. All right, but uh, Katara and Suki. Not Su- oh my gosh, that's that's Sokka's other girl. Jumping ahead, Katara and UA. <laughs> And uh, and Saga rescues Aang. Katara easily wins this fight, <laughs> and she she's cocky about that too. But she has a good reason to be at least this time. <laughs> and I love Saga's <laughs> reaction of like Saga like they kidnap him, um, and uh, well the, Saga unleashes the the rope. He's like, "This is quality rope." Mm-hmm. And then eventually they're about to leave, and the Aang is like, "No, we have to save him. He, if he's stuck out here, he's gonna die." Uh, which I just chose the character of Aang that he's so caring, like so stubborn. Aang will go out his way to save you if he can. He's that type of person. And now they're kind of even. Not that Aang holds grudges or takes count in that oh. sense, but uh, I yeah, bet in a that's true in a weird way. I bet uh, I bet Zuko does. Like Zuko saved him last time. Aang saves him this time. I bet that means something to Zuko, even if it doesn't to Aang. Yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah. All right, so we cut back to Zhao, and Zhao is at the Spirit Oasis. He captures the Moon Spirit, and the animation here is beautiful. Like it goes completely red, and I just love like the levels they give to the color, the the coloration here. So like, if the Moon Spirit is captured, and the Moon turns red, it's red, and, and then it's water super benders. dark too. Everything is like uh, like Batman yes. animated series dark. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it's funny because the I have a Batman animated series poster, and the background is red, and the moon is red. I can like, picture the poster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't alluding to it specifically, but I'm glad it. Uh, I'm glad it contributed mm-hmm. to my to yeah. my contributions mm-hmm. to this episode. Life comes full circle. Yeah. Uh, and um, and so he's there, and he is gloating, of course. He's like, they'll call me Jow the Moon Slayer. <laughs> and then Momo completely interrupts him. And just that and that weird monkey music too comes on. Dun, 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 yeah. Dun, dun. Yeah. Not my favorite music, but so, I do love it here. I tell you the, the I feel like I, I talk as as I talk about the, the creators, like I've talked to them re, per, you know, in person. <laughs> but they mentioned that they were going over music one time, like some you know, VP or some big honcho at Nickelodeon came by to listen to it, and he listened to the, that monkey song. He was like, "Don't play that again." 
<laughs> that sounds like, like something a mean head honcho would say, just with no yeah. provocation. <laughs> Ugh, Nickelodeon, um, that's why nobody likes you anymore. But there's a great moment here where Angle's like, Zhao, don't. Like, we all depend on the balance. You can't kill the moon spirit. It'll not only hurt the water tribe, it'll hurt you as well. And then Iroh, along with him, is like, the boy is right, Zhao. We all depend on the balance. And then, like, this threat that Iroh gives him is a freaking bold threat. Like, he says, tenfold. whatever you do with it, yeah, whatever you do with that spirit, Zhao, I would unleash on you tenfold. Let it go. And it's I, like, dang. I love the dynamic here. And it kind of shows that. So Aang's like, hey, you need the moon spirit. We depend on the balance. But he says it in kind of calm, cool, in a way that it makes it feel like maybe Aang, did, like, he knows it's important. But maybe he doesn't have a greater picture understanding. But like Iroh jumps in and he just kind of explodes. Like Iroh knows <laughs> yeah. that this is gonna be a bad deal, and just the force right. that he comes in with more anger and force than you've ever seen Iroh with to this point. Yes, and yes. I like yeah. I kind of kind of fall in love with him just a little bit at that point when he, <laughs> yeah, all fiery. Pun, pun Self intended. Self plug here. Uh-huh. Pun intended. Yeah, this is the, the perfect here. time. You can, uh, yeah, I have a video on what would happen if Zhao actually permanently killed the Moon Spirit, which features this same clip. And pretty much I go over what would happen if the Moon just disappeared in the world of Avatar, uh, both in a scientific sense and in more of a spiritual Avatar sense also. Like, if the Moon went away, that disrupts all the waves, and, and that would be really harmful to coastal regions or island nations, which the Fire Nation... It's, an, it's just an island nation, so they'll be wiped out. Um, and then spiritually... That would be funny. Moon... <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's terrible. And then and spiritually, if the ocean spirit was still left to ramp it, rampage throughout the world, if you're not bowing down to him, he'd probably end up killing you anyway. So I also think... So I put Chris's great video, and that's certainly the one that I intended... Uh, but also a good time just to understand where Iroh is coming from. Go ahead and watch that Life of Iroh video <laughs> as well, and I think you'll have a better grasp on why Iroh feels the way he does. So, yeah, you should go watch those videos. Not right now. Wait till we're done talking, then go watch those videos. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I love this this whole scene. And, uh, you know, I'll let you break the next part because it, like, flips a 180 real quick. Like, you think things are going right, and then no. Yeah, so uh, Iroh just straight up unleashes immense level of fire bending and i love how so once once Zhao, so Zhao kills the moon spirit or i'm sorry he but, kills so the ocean he, spirit. but he, he puts it back sorry, he kills so he's spirit. got it he's got it in the bag and yes, they're talking yes. him down he's still like talking about himself like Zhao the conqueror but then he puts it back in and you and you get a sense of reason like you actually feel like he's putting it down and then he just decides to change his mind i guess like i yeah. i almost don't know if the uh which is probably what they wanted if the creators intended it to make it look like mm-hmm. he didn't even know that he was going to do it, or if that he was just being uh, a jerk. I, and maybe they don't want us to know. Maybe they just want us to, to have to think about it. But you, you I think feel they like just it's want genuine us to at first. Build some suspense. Yeah, you feel like it's genuine at first. I did at least. Yeah. No, yeah. And then at, that point, at some point, he's like, you know what? F this. I'm a shout. I don't care. <laughs> I'm the moon um, conqueror. <laughs> and then Uncle Iroh freaking attacks them all. And at that point, the moon just goes away. Like, it's not red any longer. It just goes completely away. And everything just goes dark because there's nothing lighting the, the sky anymore. And just that scene of, of Iroh just fire being where all you see is his fire and the reflection off of other people. And, like, it's just there and it's gone. It's there and it's gone. And then how Admiral Zhao is like frightened right now. Like he's backing up and he's like, I can't handle this guy. I'm going to run away. He, uh, Iroh is like wrecking shop. He's uh, probably the yes, coolest yeah. firebending. I know I said, I said this several times this episode, which speaks to the episode, but up to this point, probably the coolest firebending we've seen. Yeah, definitely. And I would, I'm going to say something nice about the the movie. Um, you can't see and, my face the right same now, scene but it's very skeptical. In... I wish you could see my skeptical face. And in, in the movie, Iroh has a pretty great. It's not as good as this scene, 
it's just a highlight of the movie, really. Um, so in the movie, Firebenders can't create fire themselves, which I was fine with that change in the movie. What? Uh, but Iroh can because he's so advanced that he can create firebending himself. And then he just like does a move, which is a ugly, stupid looking move, I'll be honest. But then he firebends like these two flames and they're like, he's creating fire by himself. And then, so that was a, that was a, Cool it just moment. makes me think of the uh, the lame X Men character, and I forget his name. The Pyro. Lame... Pyro, yeah. And then, which is funny because yeah. just when we were talking about Xiao the Moon Conqueror, and I was like, that's such a lame name. And my first thought was, that's way lame, more lame than uh, than Fire Fist from Deadpool Two, in my opinion. <laughs> I thought I love Pyro in X Men Two. Like that scene, I did not love Pyro. Where they're it's... at Bobby Drake's house, and the police are there, and they shoot they shoot Wolverine in the head. Yeah. And, like, he... He pretty much goes down. I like that scene, Pyro's but Pyro's like, a, uh, I don't. He's like a frat boy of bad guys. I don't, I'm not a Pyro. Yeah, fan. but he's he's like, you hear about the story on the news of those bad mutants. It's like I'm the worst one. It's so Granted, corny. It's so he corny. He shouldn't really be. He, he shouldn't really be thinking like that because he was a, with the Etsmen. This whole he was at Xavier School for the gifted youngsters, but then he just takes the fire and freaking launches at the cops and stuff um i like that scene it's and really... he blows all the cars up i don't I... like the the line delivery i don't yeah, like the dialogue it itself the but yeah, i like the line dialogue. delivery the one thing that i love best about pyro is just when magneto delivers that line to him just that god among in- insects line like i just i really like that yes. line. Oh, that's yeah. um that, that's a great line because too. that's You're well a that's a very telling part that, too that's really... because that's when he says i can't create fire myself so hey, look at this full, full circle, full circle. But that that is a great, maybe the greatest line in X Men. I love that line. Yeah. And he says it with such conviction. Now I watch X Men. I love that scene. I just but... I just did while I was on vacation, sitting around somebody else's uh, house. I watched their X Men discs. It was fun. It was a good time. Uh, but yeah, full circle because yeah, he can't create his own fire, and uh, eventually he has a contraption on his hand. But Iroh needs no contraption. That's all I got. Yes. Yep. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, so then Iroh, is, he can notice from UA, you know, because he's also spiritually enhanced. He's, he says, like, you've been touched by the moon spirit. Some of its life lives in you or some of its energy, and you could give it back. And UA is like, yeah, I could. Oh, and then we, we failed to mention in previous episodes that uh, in the last episode, UA. No, when, it's actually, it's, a, it's early in this in this episode, I believe, where UA is it? Okay. All mentions right. her uh, connection to the moon spirit. Is that what you're getting at? Yes, yes, yep, yes. You're right. Episode. It's early in this episode where yep. she where she explains that when she was born, she she didn't wake up. Like she only slept. Like she was alive, um, but she she didn't sleep at all. And then her dad prayed to the ocean and moon spirit, and he put her in the water. And it's such a great scene of like. There's a reflection of the moon. Her head is dropped on the reflection, and then when he raises her up, like the white moon turns her hair into white, kind of spills over which is her light water. Which is yeah. great done. And then, yeah. Um, so then, when Iro tells her like you can heal the moon spirit, so she goes and um, and Saka's like, no, you can't do this, and she's like, no, I have to. It's she says it's my duty or it's my destiny. I think duty. I think she says it's my duty because this whole thing has been about her duty to her people, and that comes first. Fire, Fire Nation people um, say destiny. Normal people say uh, duty. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so she sacrifices herself to the Moon Spirit. Like she just falls and she's dead, and then Sokka's holding her in his arms. Like and that was a really great sentimental moment for Sokka, which she doesn't get a lot of, and she like vanishes away. And then she becomes the moon spirit and you know, she tells Sokka that she will always be with him and she goes off. Oh crap. I'm forgetting this whole huge part here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, so then she goes off and she becomes a moon spirit. Way before that, when Zhao kills the moon spirit, you know, they they say like, oh, it's over now. And the Aang just instinctively goes in the avatar state. It's like and his no, voice is so not. great. I was getting yeah. see, I was going to end with I was going to end with that just because it's my favorite part of this whole season. 
<laughs> I was gonna wrap up in that way, but we're we're there no, it, basically. Yeah, it's, yeah, we're there. It's a top moment. Yeah. So uh, he... I mean, UA UA. It's kind of simultaneously happening that yeah. UA uh, sacrifices herself for the Moon Spirit, and that's when Aang, like I said, it's very simultaneously goes into the Avatar state, and then kind of I don't want to say merges with the Moon mm-hmm. Spirit. Kind of, I or guess. The Ocean Spirit. Or the ocean spirit. He, he, he oh, that's right. I'm, I'm mixing it up. So you, the other spirit that's still alive. And uh, you know what? You go ahead and take it from here, and I'm just going to relish uh, relish the memories. Yeah, so he he steps slowly into into the pond. And what I love about this quick moment is that Katara like, reaches out to him, and Iroh's like, no, let him go. And like that says something about Iroh, that Iroh is letting what has been his you know they've been in his contest with each other nemesis, in a sense yeah they've been nemesis for this while i was like nah let him go do the thing i just love the scene of him being in the water and then just and he just drops in there and then from there like the blue the blueness of it all because the whole world is still black at this point but then that blue just fills in some with some color and then it all rises and becomes he merges with the ocean spirit. The ocean spirit is vengeful as heck. <laughs> like yes. it is this almighty powerful god. Like we haven't seen a real god in this show. Like to me, you know, there's spirits and stuff, but this is like a god level spirit. This is like a, this is Kratos getting vengeance level, uh, just with fewer or less yeah. blood. <laughs> It is like, I, and reason I call him God is because people worship him, and so when he's walking yeah. around, just uh, uh, like the water benders see him and they're like, "Oh my God!" Literally, they they bow down to him, and the other Fire Nation troops are like, "We have to attack him," and he's just like, "Whoosh, you're dead!" And then that's pretty much what he does all throughout. Like, if you're not bowing to the ocean spirit, he will kill you. That uh... and he goes out to. That that first part of that yeah, scene go. that you just described is like so he he walks up a, a canal I guess not really a street because it's water and so yeah the waterbenders are on one side fighting firebenders on the other side and they just straight up they don't even bow they just drop to their knees they just like plunk and then the fire nation yeah. they all get in, in get into stance uh, their little dab stance and he and the you can see the spirit like look over at them and just like a wave of the arm and psh, just a giant water hand slap a god hand slap thing. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah. and that's like the very first one. After that, it gets uh, a little less discretionary. But they make a very good point to show, yeah, God, Godhood. I hadn't really thought of it that way. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Then he goes out into the into the ocean and pretty much take out, you know, dozens of ships by himself to the point where the Fire Nation has to retreat. Like he's killing, you know, a bunch of people. Aang has a little control over it, um, but not enough control that. <laughs> to stop him from killing people, yeah, essentially. Absolutely. They, I mean, they don't show people dying, but come on, people, <laughs> people are dying. <laughs> and uh, it, coming back to Iroh, like Iroh, uh, so then let him go. Yeah. So Iroh, first of all, it might just yeah. be Iroh being wise. Like it's not like Iroh's like, you know what? Some of my people are gonna die, but they deserved it. No, I think it's just Iroh being like, you know what? We're probably not gonna be able to stop him, and we don't want to get in his way. And maybe he can save the Moon Spirit. Uh, but it very telling that Iroh pulls Katara back. Kind of a touching moment almost. Like, see, we're on the same team. <laughs> and uh, and then they just go watch Aang slash Ocean Spirit Rec Shop. And it's awesome. Yeah, and then at this point, Zuko catches back up with Zhao. Um, and they have a great fight. And it's just, um, you know, it's still dark. And so their fire just illuminating everything. And this time, Zuko's way better at this fight than he was in their first fight, which was in like episode three. And that shows a lot of progression that Zuko has had. I mean, he definitely wins this fight, like without some type of comeback <laughs> resurgence in it. He controls the fight from early on. And and just their introduction to each other of like, Zhao says, you're supposed to be, and he's like, no, you're it can't be. Or something or like something. That. Yeah. yeah, you're alive. And then Zuko sounds pissed off like, you tried to have me killed. And then they have this nice interaction with each other. Like this is a kids show, and they're talking about a person is firing another person, and he's mad because he put out a hit on him, and, 
out of place to make a murdered in cold blood pun here. Uh, I've had better jokes, but yeah. it it's pretty heavy stuff. And then the fight's pretty. My only complaint is we're we're getting to the end of the episode here. I imagine they were running out of time. Fight's pretty short, but it's very short in Suko's favor. Yeah, it's pretty short. Yeah. Uh, so then the moon spirit, the after UA sacrificed herself, the ocean spirit, the moon spirit comes back, and Zhao is like, it, "This can't happen. Like, how can this be?" And then, and then the moon spirit, I'm oh, sorry, the ocean spirit looks up. He's like, "Oh, moon spirit's back. Okay, <laughs> I can cool. go back to being a fish again." <laughs> Sorry guys, my bad. And then, no, 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 not my bad. He but just, you guys deserved just, it. Just, just, to, just to chill. In fact, you guys deserved it so much. Before I leave, I'm taking Adam Rojao with me. Oh and, yeah. And Zuko does. Yeah, and Zuko does try to save him. <clears throat> he does. Very genuine um, effort. Yeah, which shows like, oh, okay, Zuko's very noble. He fails. Um, yeah, Zhao so yeah, kind of so, Zhao kind of retracts Zhao's, a little Zhao's bit. Zhao's too proud. Like, gosh. And he's just like, oh, then he's like, no. You know, I wouldn't say and we don't see Zhao person, again until. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm glad he died. <laughs> like, yeah, wouldn't say it about a real person, but it's a cartoon, so it's fine. Yeah. I mean, I'll say about I'm glad Osama bin Laden died, I guess. Yeah, so, maybe yeah. there's real people you can say it about. I'm just glad I didn't there's have to make that distinction for, for a cartoon. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Hitler, uh, presuming he's dead, which I believe he is, uh, you know, bin Laden, that's a good one. Uh, point is, um, he's he's very obviously on one side of that argument. That's not a good side to be on. But he died how he lived, and that was uh, you uh, know, being yeah. a jerk. And that's pretty much the end of the episode. <laughs> well, not quite. Uh, Suko and Iro, it shows them pretty much that's leaving, and then uh, Iro says, "Aren't you gonna chase the Avatar?" And then it he says, "No, I'm too tired," or "No, I'm tired," or something like that. But you don't. I mean, you don't really buy it. Like, you get a sense of uh, of respect under there. And then Iroh kind of covers for him. He's like, yeah, and grown uh, men need their need their rest or whatever. <laughs> and so just uh, some nice, like, between the lines communication there. I think it shows a lot respect. of... I think it shows a lot of growth for Zuko since the first episode. Yeah. I feel like the first episode, he was more like an angry boy. And now he has become more of a man. And Iroh realizes that, I think. Yeah, maybe that's Iroh. I didn't really think about that. Iroh kind of directly addressing that. Like, a man needs his rest, and you just said you needed a rest. So, good work, team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and that... Also, I think Iroh says, says you're going to capture, like, the way his facial expression is when he's like, shouldn't you be capturing the Avatar? Like, he almost seems like, like, I know Iroh doesn't care about the Avatar. A little smirky, uh, what's the word? Like, kind of a tease, like a grandparent teasing you maybe, or a parent, I suppose, yeah. teasing you a little bit. Yeah. And I think that's pretty much the end of the uh, episode. Yeah, so then, so then it ends with, um, oh, I absolutely love this moment with um, Sokka and the chief of the Water Tribe. You know, he says, Sokka pretty much is checking in on him, and <clears> the chief says... When I had a vision, moon, the spirits gave me a vision that my daughter would one day become the moon. And then Saga says, you must be incredibly proud. And he says, proud and sad. Like, gosh, that is such a great freaking moment. Like, That's the right thing to say. You can't just, just be just proud. Like, your daughter still died. So way to cover it up. And with it, uh, it has made it more meaningful. You can't yeah. just be proud when your daughter dies. Then she'd feel bad. You got to be a little sad. It's very touching. This yeah, uh, exactly. this episode yeah. hit me in the feels. Let's say the last uh, eight eight ish minutes of this episode will punch your feels pretty hard. Yeah, that moment there punched me in the feels. Straight in their stomachs. So, what a great yeah. A great essentially, ending. after that, they're uh, that pretty much wraps it all up. Like Katara uh, officially gets the title of Master. From Master Paku. Yeah. Because she's like, uh, Master Paku says, like, all right, we're going to go to the Southern Water Tribe and help out our sister tribe again. We haven't done that in a while. And then Katara's like, well, who's going to train Aang? And he's like, well, Aang better get used to calling you Master Katara. 
and that just shows how freaking far Qatar has come in the season. Like in the beginning of the season, Aang was clearly better at her in water bending because he was a national talent at it, and now she is a master water bender. Yeah. I also, we didn't really talk about it because it's not that important, but in the first episode at the very beginning, when Aang is slacking off, and, and Paku mm-hmm. makes a comment about it, and he's like, well, I have learned to move, and then he like turns himself into a snowman, and I really like that part. <laughs> but, it does a good job there. Again, you're, it's it sort of progresses. Like, it's not just, hey, Katar is magically better than Aang now. That, that piece there mm-hmm. versus this piece at the end of this episode shows a sense of uh, scaled growth, I guess. Yeah. And no, great, great freaking episodes. Tremendous, tremendous finale. Let's. Do you want to talk about just how great these episodes are? I do. Excellent. I want to assign monetary, not monetary, monetary value. Uh, numerical, numerical, numerical value. value to them. Yeah. Let's do that. That's my favorite. All part. right. So, IO visual for me. Uh, nine and a half, um, and it really, I think it was just the first episode that took, couldn't make this perfect. But just that you know moment where Aang merges with the ocean spirit, and the music kicks in, and just that visually, like this, it was just done so well. So without a doubt, it was a it was a nine and a half out of ten. Uh, Story wise, uh, gave it a ten out of ten. And the reason why I gave this one ten was that UA had a freaking great arc in in this in these past couple episodes that I think she was really the main focal point here. Like Aang doesn't necessarily grow all that much. He doesn't have an arc in here. Uh, but I think really there was more focus on UA. And I think I really noticed that this last time watching that I didn't notice before that I just really appreciated a lot more. And Zuko, how far along he's come. And, yeah, I just really enjoyed the story here. So that gets a 10 out of 10. Memorable, 9.5 out of 10. This was the episode, I think, that changed Avatar for me. It it took it to another level. And, and watching it, you know, especially that scene with the ocean spirit, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, the fact that people are bowing to him and just that story aspect of it it's it's just always one of my favorite moments like i have to pay attention when that moment happens it's so good so that brings my score up to a 9.8 out of 10 it is definitely one of my favorite episodes worth noting it was a 9.75 and it rounds up and that's going to come into play in a moment Uh, we've never we've never agreed so closely on scores or points ever. I looked <laughs> historically, and we have not. Audiovisual nine point five. Everything that you said. Uh, the only reason it's nine point five instead of a ten is because I felt like all of the action scenes, just because they had too much to fit in. I get it. Uh, but all the action scenes were just too fleeting. Like you didn't get to be invested in, in Aang uh, attacking these ships. Like it was very point. quick. Um, the fights were very quick, all that stuff. But I think there's just so much to pack in. Um, and then the first episode, you know, for an, for an hour long, the first one's a little slower. But these are such minor details. So it's not perfect in my eyes, but 9.5, that's great. Story, 10, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, These two episodes, um, you, I mean, you need the previous one episode, in a sense, for reasons that we've talked about. But these two episodes... Uh, there's there's nothing even close to matching their arc and their importance, um, the grandness sort of within these episodes themselves, but then also to the larger story, everything. Love it. You mentioned the focus on UA. Uh, I think you make the same case for look at how far, not completely because we've known these characters for longer, but Zuko, Iroh, Sokka, um, Katara, mm-hmm. maybe not is in detail, but they make a point to show her growth as well, so... Yep. Tons of great story. And then 9.5. So we actually had the exact same scores all the way around. Wow. <laughs> uh, there again, the only reason I'm not getting 0.5 is because I don't always specifically remember the details of the of the first half. I remember how it all ends and culminates, and I love it. Yeah. I don't necessarily remember everything that leads up to it, some of those fuzzy. And, and that's going to happen with long episodes. That being said, it's not perfect, but it's really, really good. So our score is exactly lined up. 
However, because of the way that I weight them, mine's only a 9.7 flat. <laughs> Yours is 9.75. I know that seems really stupid, but uh, because I weight them differently. Oh, and so our average score was like 9.72 or something like that. But the point is, far and away, the best episode uh, to this point. If you don't mind, I'm going to elaborate one more time. I really like how you said this episode that changed Avatar for you. Um, this was a portion where I was uh, binging through this, I think. Like, I rolled from... when The first time I saw it, I believe I rolled from, like, the last disc of this season and through a couple of the next season. Um, and I just remember feeling how... It, it this was a huge build up for me like i went to that person's room and me and those other two friends popped this disc in and watched these four episodes and there was such a steep quick build up that just like launches you into the second season i was so excited so maybe not quite the same experience you had but a similar feeling of uh just mm-hmm. this propels you forward into the story so 9.72 essentially uh that's a great score massively immensely better than anything else we've seen cumulatively to this point so that's pretty cool that's it hey watch this episode watch every episode of course but you know what you you could probably gather a ton if you're fairly perceptive uh if you just watch this episode you could probably pick up a good chunk of what's happened in the entire series yeah i wouldn't recommend it i would just go watch the whole series but (laughs) So I, I think I watched this episode with my sister once, like my oldest sister. And she's the type of person who doesn't care about spoilers at all. Me neither. Which you're like that also. We've had that, yeah. We've had and, that talk. Yeah, yeah. And I don't agree with that at all. But <laughs> she was, she was... <laughs> That's fine. Hey, that's fine. I get it. And she, she just watched a singular. It might have been this one episode she watched. She's like, oh, yeah, this is really good. And then, of course, like that's just an opening door for me for like, yeah, you should watch this and this. And, <laughs> and then she's like, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, listen. It's not that I don't think that spoilers are real. I've gotten to a point where when <laughs> movies are in theaters, I will accept a little bit of when you pay for the theater visit, you're paying for an experience, and that's part of it. And I get that. But anytime once that movie is out of theaters. In my mind, it's like anytime you're paying for the movie from this point forward, it's just to own it or have it or watch it in, in your own house. It's like, whatever. It's either good or bad, and that's all you get. But in the theater, I will give you that There's uh, everything is more more dramatic and you want a certain kind of experience. So I've, I've grown a little bit. Not too much. I don't go to the theater, so what do I care? <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say in conclusion to this one other than uh, tremendous, tremendous ending to a season it's not my favorite season overall but it's the first season of a show i don't know what else to expect uh but an amazing end it is a very solid finale to it like it is yes i mean it's just a great finale all three finales are great but uh like i said there's something about this one that does an amazing job of of setting the tone for what you're going to get into from this point forward and also it's good that the this season ended with a win sort of for team avatar but it was still an earned win like there was still sacrifice in this win um does exactly. and how the end season two is is you know it's 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 a great story progression it's like all right here's the heroes up now we're gonna take our heroes down and now they got to build themselves back up now the the in the finale of season two probably is a better maybe like a better cliffhanger um I don't oh, know I if I that cliffhanger. Yeah, I don't know if I like that finale as much for that reason though. It's such a painful one. Uh, but this one yeah. still well, does, this one still does a great job of leaving you with a lot of cliffhanger type questions. Like you've just seen something so drastically different from Suko and Iroh uh, that you wonder what's going to happen. Uh, you have we have no idea what the gang is going to do next. Like there's been no talk of their plans yeah. after this. So they, there's a number of sure. good questions. Just there's, yeah. Not a oh, and we didn't mention that it ends off with sort of a post credit scene, in which I love the scene of of uh, introducing Azula to us for technically the second time, but really this is her first introduction. Yeah, we saw it in like that Fire picture Lord. earlier. The the flashback is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yep. <clears throat> Where the Fire Lord is just you know. This is also one of our first introductions of Fire Lord, but you still don't get a big sense of who he is. Like they keep building up this big bad. And he says to Zula, "Your uncle Iroh is a traitor. Your brother Zuko is a failure. 
I have a mission for you. And she just goes and, and like, just a look on her face, like just spells trouble for next season. One of my favorite voice actresses of, of all time. Uh, I can't think of her name. Help me out here. She plays Azula. Ray she plays, she plays the bad girl in all of the cartoons and yes. she's fantastic at all. Although her last name isn't, isn't Delisle anymore. She's gotten married since awesome. then, but um, <laughs> yeah, go for her. Sam from Danny Phantom. She's Vicky. She's yep. uh, there's another big one that oh, applies I didn't know she to was Vicky. I think she's Vicky. Don't quote me. Now I you got it myself. Um, and then I thought she there played, was another. She voices Catwoman. Those and, were two of mine. And uh, in the Arkham games. I didn't know that. Uh, I I say Vicky and uh, Sam because Danny Phantom and Fairly Odd Parents are probably two of my favorite cartoons. And so, and then, the, like I said, there's a third one that I'm forgetting that she's very important to. I can't think of it is. Long story short, we get to meet Azula, oh. and that's very exciting. For real, though. So, um, yeah, I mean, what else do you say? Uh, I will say that we will probably, I will probably take two weeks off. And in the week that I have off, at least I hope is my plan, is I really am going to make a concentrated effort to move our episodes over to Podient. That's what I'm going to call it. And make a concentrated effort on getting us onto YouTube and Google Play because that would be really cool. I think the best part. Oh, we're on YouTube. Oh, I'm sorry. What did I? Uh, iTunes. I'm such an anti Apple person. I don't even acknowledge iTunes exists. Um, I'm just kidding. Please listen to our podcast and and say nice things. But the good good part about those is that the uh, when you get good reviews, the the podcast algorithm is based almost solely off good reviews. So if you get a couple good reviews, that has a way of propelling you more so than say like a thumbs up on YouTube or things like that. So, you know, a couple of good reviews could get us to a couple of listeners that really cared. And that would, that'd be a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to yeah. the potential of that. And what a better time to do it than after a season finale, turning over a new leaf. Been a great pursuit. Yeah. Also we're, uh, I think we're going to do a uh, top episodes of season one. Oh yeah, and let's, then, maybe of course, we'll I fire gonna, off with that next time before we jump into season yeah. two. And yeah. then I was going to force you to watch uh, The Last Airbender, and we're going to review that. We'll re- I think we'll review it in the format that I review movies on. Okay. Um, so we're going to try and be as objective as possible, but then the latter half of that review... Can we I'm just bash just it in the latter half? And, and yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> not that we should do our planning on the show, but while we're talking about this, why not a good time? I have to make a trip uh, to your neck of the woods at some time anyway. Um, if, you, if you're if you okay with that, I'll just make a guest appearance in the uh, Room of Doom Ooh. you have over there, and we'll do we'll watch and make an evening of it, and it'll be solid. Um, I'll throw popcorn at the TV every time something dumb happens. It's a good time to point out, I have not seen this movie. I, I think we've mentioned that before. I have assumed and heard that it's horrible, so I have not watched it. And I already don't care for M. Night Shyamalan. No offense, Chris. And hey, so this I love will, M. Night Shyamalan. This will, be, this will be my first experience of this movie uh, very intentionally. So, yeah, okay, so that's good because that also gives me maybe a couple weeks to move these old podcasts over, which it could take some time because my internet's really slow. So, uh, all right. Hey, that sounds good. Uh, Chris, thanks for jumping on. Yeah, great season one, book one. We made it through a whole season. We are one third of the way uh, to getting to start Cora. That's what that's what you're really excited <laughs> about, I think. So thanks for watching. Make sure you go watch Chris's other videos. He's put up some great videos recently. That's at the or the Objective Geek on YouTube and at Objective underscore Geek on Twitter. My name's Sean Taylor. Go to seantaylor.com dot com to find out more than you need to know about me. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll be back in a couple weeks.